You know, if you're like me, you come to programs like this and you spend all of your time across the hall and around the corner and you're going to all these meetings learning about new technology, learning about new techniques. But to be honest, your success, my success, depends a lot more on what we're talking about this afternoon than it does on learning a new way to do a connected tissue graft. And whether you are pretty secure in your, future, in your practice right now or you're maybe a little uncertain because of the economy or the election, to a great degree, your success is going to depend on how you embrace change, how you create a vision of what you think your practice should be, and then take those critical steps to transition that vision to reality. So for the next hour, we're going to try to put this piece, all these pieces of the puzzle together. We're going to, to talk about the changes that are out there that you and I are having to practice within. We're going to talk about the megatrends that are driving those changes, the practice that we aspire to have. What is our vision? And what's the action plan to put it in place? How about the relationships that we have to build and even more importantly sustain? And then finally, how are we going to implement these? Successful practices are dynamic. They're constantly changing. And while there are no facts about the future, here's what we know.
it's obvious that status quo is not an option, right? Like Mark Twain said, even if you're on the right track, you're going to get run over if you just sit there. And you know what? There's all sorts of good examples out there in the industry where that has happened. For example, Timex, for over a half a century in the United States, was the market leader in watches and timepieces. In about 1969, one of their own technicians developed the quartz movement digital watch. He was excited about his invention. He took it to the board of directors of Timex. He showed it to them. You know, they, they looked at it, they opened it up. There were no moving parts. It didn't look like a watch. They were so unimpressed that they didn't even bother to cover their own invention with a patent, not realizing that they themselves had just created a game changer. About that same time, a company called Kodak had just developed a new imaging system that allowed them to take a picture and print it on plain paper. Wow! But you know what? That image was so grainy, they just didn't see how that fit in their portfolio. And they had this crazy company kind of on the side that was interested in the technology. They knew it probably wouldn't go too far because it had a stupid name called Xerox. Timex went through a bankruptcy. Kodak is in bankruptcy. And Xerox continues to reinvent themselves to stay relevant in the world. You know, in the 1980s, they were the copier company. In the 1990s, they were the document company. Today, they're the knowledge company. And we in Paradox have to do the same thing. We've got to be prepared to continue to reinvent ourselves. Because when I got out of my residency in 1979, I was certain about a lot of things. But there were three things that I knew with absolute certainty. One is, is that I could make a great living just treating periodontal disease. Number two, you can't cover roots of teeth with grafts. It just does not work. And implants, forget it, they don't work. Well, what do I know with great certainty 33 years later? I know that I cannot make a good living just treating periodontal disease. I cover roots of, t of teeth with grafts every day, and I know that implants are not only the most successful thing in dentistry, but all of medicine. But you know what? I also know that I can't grow papillas or regenerate class refurcations. Well, what do you think we're going to know for certainty out into the future? You know, I enjoy reading books about business, about change, what makes change sticky or, or take hold. And they all talk about paradigm shifts that they name different things. But they really talk about the fact that during one of these times of tipping point or whatever you want to call it, the environment changes. And from that point onward, nothing is ever the same. Now, it doesn't mean if you're talking about, for example, a technology. It doesn't mean that a technology all of a sudden is, is in place. It means that technology that could have been there for a long time all of a sudden is more relevant than it could have ever been in the past. And when it comes to periodontics, our profession, these transitions can have a profound effect on who we are as a profession. And how we manage these transitions to a great degree determines our future. And I wish Paul and I could sit up here and tell all of you exactly what you need to do to be successful as things change, but we can't because our vision of success for each one of us is going to be a little different. But I do know that the winds of change are more important than how we set our sails. I know that we can, we can navigate through dense fog and uncharted waters if we know where we're going and we have the navigational tools to get there. And so that's where I want to spend the next hour. Let's talk about where we want to go and let's talk about what navigational tools we have that will allow us to get there. I want to end this little piece of the puzzle on change because my whole lecture here is about change with one of my favorite stories about the exponential effect of change. And it comes not from a scientist or a futurist. It comes from a child's riddle. And it goes like this. On day one, there's this large lake, and it has yet just a single lily pad. Every day, those number of lily pads double. Until on the 30th day, that lake is completely overcome with lily pads. The question is, on what day was that lake half full of lily pads? And the answer is the 29th day. It took that lake 29 days to become half full of lily pads, but it only took an additional 24 hours for it to be overcome. Welcome to day 29 of periodontal practice as we've known it in the past. And beware when your friends along the periphery of the lake call out to you and say, take your time, 
the navigational lanes are wide open. It's only half full of lily pads. So what's out there that's driving those changes? You know, what are these megatrends that maybe we can't see, but they're just over the horizon here? You're beginning to feel the pull of them, but you can't quite yet see them. All of us are exposed, you just go down to the, to the exhibit hall right now, all of us exposed to a tremendous amount of technology. How can we tell which one of those technological changes we need to pay attention to? How can we tell which one of those trends do we need to pay attention to? How do we know the signal from the noise? How do we make sure we're not asleep at the wheel? I'd suggest you do what Andy Grove suggests, and that is apply the silver bullet test. And that is, when you see a new trend or you see a new technology, ask yourself, if that were 10 times better than it is today, would I be impressed or not? or if it's a new trend. And if the answer is no, you wouldn't be impressed or maybe threatened, then life's going to go on with another gadget. But if you look at a new technology or a trend and you say, even though it's not that impressive today, if it were 10 times better than it is, yeah, that might be threatening or that would really be cool, then that's something you need to keep your eye on. That has the potential to be a game changer. We need to discipline ourselves to separate the quality of the initial version to the long-term significance and impact of a new technology. Our ability to identify emerging trends are essential to discovering tomorrow's opportunities. Think about implants. When they came on, that was a fringe dentistry. You know, Most technology is not adopted in its first version. Apply the silver bullet test to these things as you see them. So, while there are no facts about the future, what we know for abs absolute certainty is that your practice to be successful in the future will not resemble the way it's been in the past for three well-documented reasons. One is your patients. Patients are different than they've been in the past. Number two, community attitudes about health, wellness, and how it all interrelates have changed dramatically. And number three, technology will radically change the way you treat your patients. And I'm not talking about pie in the sky, may happen technology. I'm talking about technology that is already present in one form or another. Well, let's talk first about the patients. For one thing, they're healthier. We're being told that only about 8 to 13 percent of the population in industrialized world has severe periodontal disease. And those, that group is linked to clearly identifiable risk factors in socioeconomic strata. Most disease is mild to moderate, therefore. And if you're like me, you, you certainly know the third one, and that is most disease is treated in the general practice. But you know what? There's new information. In fact, it's being reported here this afternoon with the AP and the CDC that there may actually be two to three times more severe periodontal disease out there. That these, these last, that data I showed that we've been seeing for years, it was underreported. And if indeed there's almost 50% of the population with significant periodontal disease, that too could be a game changer that you need to start preparing your practice for. You can use that and, and use this information to your advantage in many ways. In addition to that, our patients are older. Last year in 2011, the very first baby boomer turned 65 years old. But for this group, they've got more teeth than any previous geriatric group. They're not like my parents who lost teeth as they grew older. They have gone to the dentist their entire life, they value what you and I do, and they are willing to pay for it. Many of these patients, though, are living with chronic diseases that are highly complex, and because of that, risk assessment and risk management is even more important than ever. Not only managing their existing disease, but managing future disease. This is important because they expect you to do risk assessment in your office. It's a way to set yourself apart from other offices. They want you to identify a path for them before they're sick. These patients also have different expectations. By 2020, one in five of our patients will be 65 years or older. But for these patients, living older is not enough. They want to live better. They're interested in health, wellness, cosmetics, comfort. And you know what? They've got the money to pay for it. We are seeing the largest transfer of discretionary wealth in the history of the world 
as the baby boomers move into power. They're self-educating through the internet. They're determining what treatment they're going to accept and who they're going to allow to provide that treatment. You know, as the world moves from a handshake to a keystroke, our patients are transforming into informed consumers with increasing responsibility to select from a wide array of choices. And for you to be successful, you have to be prepared to provide those choices. Community attitudes about health, wellness, and its relationship to the oral environment has changed dramatically with a shocking discovery that the mouth is connected to the rest of the body. Like any new area of discovery, it's kind of iffy. But I tell you, if we find a true connection, that true too will be a game changer, at least it has the potential to be. Because all of a sudden, if our science, and it's looking like it's going to happen, if our science bears out connections, then all of a sudden you and I are going to be receiving patients with, with systemic problems and periodontal disease. All of a sudden, medical treatment will include treatment and diagnosis of periodontal disease. But by whom? We'll see more collaboration with our physicians on patient treatment and research. But more collaboration also means more head-to-head -head competition with oral surgeons as to who is the go-to source for dental knowledge in the medical world. We'll also see physicians treating some periodontal, uh, th uh, periodontal disease. So we have to be prepared for this. It, too, has the potential to be a game changer. Technology is changing the way that we perform our treatment and we make our living. Technology has a dark side and a positive side. The dark side is, is that some technology will put periodontal uh, treatment in the hands of others. It's going to eliminate some of the things that you and I have depended on for a source of our livelihood. Drugs, both local and systemic, may stabilize attachment loss, reduce inflammatory mediators, magnify root plane and scaling, maybe even prevent the need for root plane and scaling. You know, you may say, yeah, we've had those kind of drugs in the past and they haven't worked so well. Apply the silver bullet test. What if they were 10 times better? You know, we have to be prepared for this. But the good news is, is that for every door that technology closes, it opens three or four more. But you know what? It only opens those doors for those clinicians that, that are watching, that see those doors opening and walk through them with the right knowledge, attitude, and skill. We can't continue to have the same periodontal practices we've had in the past. I hate to tell you, but, but regular periodontal therapy probably won't be enough to make you successful. You need to make certain that you are in the position to provide sophisticated surgical services, sophisticated regenerative therapy around teeth, around implants, on ridges, uh, sinus grafts, block grafts, mesh grafts, all of this, and you need to have the, the anesthesia support for sophisticated surgical procedures. You and I need to get rid of the practice limited to philosophy. It's also time to reclaim periodontics. Our field is, our scope of practice is constantly under attack. There's one thing that nobody else can do that we do very well, and that's periodontics. We need to focus on the regeneration of hard and soft tissue, implant site development and placement techniques, treatment of periodontal disease and periimplantitis, perioplastic procedures, and more. Remember, if the, the CDC data is true, and there really are 50% of the folks out there with severe periodontal disease, this could be a game changer. If the periosystemic connection is proven, this could be a game changer. We need to make certain that you and I reclaim who we are and what we do best. Yes, we need to continue to place implants. We need to be the best at this. But we can't depend on implants for the future as the past as the rest of dentistry becomes involved in implants. Also, the boundaries of our discipline are blurring. I think it's important for periodontics to be able to provisionalize teeth. You know, it, it makes sense. It's just an extension of soft tissue guidance and it allows us to deliver the patient to the restorative office where all they have to do is make a simple impression and deliver a crown. I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed when I got out of my residency 33 years ago that I would be placing doing provisional realization. It needs to be part of who, who we are and what we do as periodontists. 
Most changes in technology are incremental. But there are te technological changes out there that are transformational. The leapfrog technologies, they're like a steamroller. If you're not on them, you're destined to become part of the road. And I can think of at least a couple that are possibles. You know, how about the digital revolution of the promise of seamless, de seamless delivery of care? This is already out here, that you can send your patient, have a CAT scan made, you can do a digital impression, those two data sets can be married, you can sit down at your computer, plan the case, send the, the case to your CAD CAM milling machine right here. It creates a surgical guide for you. You take it to the patient, you put the surgical guide, which was created off the computer. While you're placing your implant, the CAD CAM milling machine creates a provisional, I mean, creates a custom abutment and a provisional restoration, or maybe even the final restoration. You can do that today. How about create a CAD CAM implant? where that same milling machine creates a custom implant, you dip it in the magic solution. There's no reason to think that's not just around the corner. That could be a game changer. Within an hour or two at the most, depending on the complexity of your case, the patient walks in, leaves with everything accomplished. Another is robotics. You know, if you need uh, brain surgery or you need prostate surgery, it's going to be done robotically. If it's not, you need to find somebody else that's going to do it. I know we've had robotic implant placement, haven't we? Hadn't been too exciting. Do the silver bullet test. If it were 10 times better, yeah, I think that's something I might want to pay attention to. So the point is we need to be looking for that next big thing that's going to take the place of implants, that's going to do for us what implants has done for the past, that's going to be that game changer for us. And we can't do it if we're sitting there with our, our head between our legs. Now, earlier I said that we've got to know where we're going and have the navigational tools to get there. This is the knowing where you're going part. How many of you have defined the vision of what your practice wants to be, what, what you want it to be? Have you written it down? Have you really given it some thought? Very important. If you haven't, it'll probably never happen. You know, your vision of the future shapes your actions today. And your actions today shape your future. It needs to be written down. It needs to be communicated. It's not something that you put under your pillow. You need to share it with your staff, your spouse, with everybody. And you need to set goals, 5, 10, 15, 20-year goals. They need to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. And successful goal setters know that you can't set goals in only one area of your life. It doesn't work that way. You have to set goals in all areas of your life, and success in one area spills over to another area. So very important that, that you set specific goals. I'm a big believer that success is a mind game. Each one of us can achieve anything you can concretely believe. But you have to believe it. You have to believe that you're sitting there and you're going to chip that ball into the, onto the green that's going to run between those vases and drop in. If you don't believe in yourself, you make it unanimous. And why not dream big? Who's in charge? Can the AP give you a successful practice? No, they should be your best ally. But unfortunately, nobody owes you a career. Sorry to tell you. Your career is your business. It's a sole proprietor, and you are a single employee. And you are in business with millions and millions of other sole proprietors and single employees all over this world. It's your job to protect this business of yours from harm. It's your job to position it, to take advantage of this changing environment that we're in. Nobody else can do that for you. And by the way, don't stand around and wait for good things to happen. Go out and make good things happen. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm a big believer in mentors. Mike's been a good mentor for me. I've spent my entire career standing on shoulders of other people. You know, when, when I got out of my residency, I went to people like John Pritchard, Bob Shalhorn, Gary Maynard, Bill Becker. I told all of those people, I said, you know, I, 
I really admire what you do. I want to go out. I want to do studies. I want to contribute to the literature meaningfully. But I want to do it in a private practice environment, not in academics. And I, I, I really, what you've done is cool. How did you do that? You know what? If you tell somebody that, they immediately think you're a pretty smart guy. And what I found is they just open their life to you. You know, they'll help you. And I have done that my entire career. I continue to do that. It's a great thing to do. Find mentors. Also, know that it really, somebody's always got it worse than you do. You know, I, you may say, yeah, but my community, the, the economy is really terrible. We've got you know, all sorts of unemployment. I guarantee you that there are strategies that you already know that can make you successful. You just got to go out and do them. I guarantee you there are people that, in, that are in situations far worse than you may think you are that are extraordinarily successful. You know, Spain, 40% unemployment. Greece, even worse. I can find you periodontists in Spain that are fabulously successful. And you can do that too. The first thing is you have to market yourself. And you want to start marketing, if you can, while things are good. You don't start marketing when you start seeing holes in the schedule. The best time to do it is while you're running good. You have to ask yourself, you know, why would somebody come to me? Nobody's going to beat a path to their door unless they know who you are. Doing marketing is like winking at somebody in the dark. You know what they're do you're doing, but nobody else does. Marketing is all about retaining current patients and attracting new patients. But you've got to know what patients you're looking for, and you've got to know what procedures you want to do. That's why the visioning comes first. Once you know that, then you can create a marketing program to attract those type of people. And you need to constantly uh, monitor the, the marketing. You need to change it. And, and you need to also know, why are you doing this? You're doing it for education, communication, and relationship building. Because dentistry, in its most basic form, is about treating teeth. But in reality, it's really about treating people that are attached to those teeth and the referrals that sent you those patients. Those are our customers that we're marketing to. And you can't stop doing it ever. Your customers, and like Paul said, we've got two customers. Our customers are our general dentists, our referrals, and our patients. Your customers cannot develop an interest in you or a treatment they do not know exists or a treatment they don't know you provide. How are you going to do that? A zillion ways. One study club. You know, a lot of us do that. It's a great way to build relationships, share information. We have a learning center in our office. Seats about 35 people. Uh, glass doors that open into our uh, reception area for our surgical area. Patients come in. They're checking in with our surgical concierge. And, and the patient says, well, what's this? Oh, well, that's a classroom. You mean people come here to learn? Your, your doctors teach other doctors? I tell you, if I didn't have one class in that room ever, it would pay the rent for the room. Newsletters, whether it's electronic or, or snail mail, you know, to tell patients, to tell referrals what you're doing in their office, in your office that's going to add value to their life. Office brochures or, or first impression have to be first rate before and after photos to both your, your patients as well as your, your doctors. People forget how good you are, what you did. You know, you need to remind them. On hold messages. Most of us have on hold messages. What are your, what's your on hold message talking about? Most of the time is talking about periodontics. Well, who is also on that phone? In fact, a lot of studies show that your patients are on the phone about 40% of the time. Your referring offices are on the phone about 40 the other time. You want to make sure your on-hold message is also saying well, how important the referring office is and all sorts of other things. Websites. You can't live without websites anymore, can you? You know, they're, they're extraordinarily important. They educate our customers, establish credibility, promote services. They need to be easily navigable. They need to be SEO optimized. It's nice if they'd be mobile friendly. You know, this is our website. It has uh, three kind of portals that you can go to. One's a professional portal. So if you want to take a course or you have a patient that may fit one of our studies and you're a, a professional, you can go through that way. Middle is the patient. So they can, you know, education or pick up forms uh, about, uh, you know, the visits they're going to have. The other is, is uh, one on guided surgery. It allows us to try to compete with other uh, 
uh, nationwide uh, uh, surgical things. And, and, you know, it's nice because I, I want the patients to see these other sites. I want them to, to feel this total picture. It makes them feel that they're in the right spot. Social media was mentioned a few moments ago. All of us have to be out there in social media. That's kind of hard from a guy like me who, you know, I'm to the probably end, middle to end of my career, and this is a whole new set of tools I'm having to learn. But your patients are already out there surfing the web, learning for all of this, and you need to be out there too. And if your website's going to be where you need it to be, you've got to be, have social media presence. You've got to be in Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. All of those kind of things are very important. Social media isn't a fad. Obviously, it's not, and it is a game changer. 
And you've got to be prepared to get involved. You get involved because it connects your patients and practice in a direct way. It connects them in a real-time way. And if you have a large enough following on social media, you have a, a cancellation this afternoon for a 3 o'clock uh, uh, cleaning appointment. You can post it on Twitter or Facebook. Say, anybody need uh, cleaning this afternoon, call the office. But the most important thing is it creates a personalized marketing experience for each patient. And to, with today's population, the baby boomers, they value personalization. They value to be able to have real-time contact with you in your office. You do it to build relationships. Now, initially, you're going to do it to build relationships with your existing patients. It helps them understand they're in the right spot. Later on, it becomes an external marketing tool. But you need to have a clear goal in mind. You need to make certain that it integrates with your brochures, your websites, your, your, your everything, because it's building your brand to, market, to maximize your marketing efforts. And the most frightening thing to me is you've got to update, update, update. You don't have to do it yourself, though. You can delegate it out to your office. You need to update it a number of times a day. People need to be looking at this. If they're not, it's like calling an, uh, a helpline and be putting on hold. It doesn't create a good feeling. You've got also to forget the one-size-fits-all. Market leaders don't try to be everything to everybody. You have to focus on who your customers are, what business you're in, and on providing extraordinary service. Everybody know the 80-20 rule? 20% 20 of your patients and 20% of your referrals send you 80% of your patients. Do you know who that 20% are? You better. You've got to understand their needs, and you've got to concentrate your activities on these people. Doesn't mean you're going to do it in an exclusionary way. That you're going to forget all those other people because you'll need those people to come up and fill the ranks over the years, but you need to dance with the guy that brung you. And... Target the best practices. Another little pearl that I did years ago that worked great. You know, sit down and, and write on, on a piece of paper, what are the 10 best practices in my community? It's easy. I mean, you, you can come up with the 10 best practices in your community. Then go out to each one of those and tell them what you did. You know, I sit down and I wrote down the 10 best practices in Houston. And you're on that list. And you know, We've worked really hard to develop a world-class periodontal practice. You know, it seems like that it would fit that we're working together. I tell you what, when you sit down and tell them that you think they're in the group of the 10 best dentists in Houston, they, again, think you're a pretty smart guy. Now, I didn't get 10 of them, but I got four of them, and I still have three of the four 30 years later. If you haven't, you might try that. You've got to ask to get. Even seasoned sales professionals have difficulty in asking for the order. You know, they go through all the other processes, but they don't ask. Very few dentists will send you a patient if you don't ask them to send you a patient. Even more, very few patients will think of sending you a patient if you don't ask, because probably they came through a doctor, they're sitting in your office, it's busy, their phone's ringing off the wall, the last thing they think you even need is a new patient. You've got to ask to get. And you've got to recognize and thank these people. You know, if a patient sends me a patient, I write them a handwritten note. You can give them coupons to go to the movies. You can give them free cleanings. You can give them all sorts of things. With your referrals, you know, that 20% that's sending you those folks, we're sending, you know, cookies and food and stuff for the staff, you know, periodically throughout the year, making sure that they know that we appreciate what they do. You know, we're sending them, you know, sports tickets. We're taking them to things. We're giving presents during holiday season. But you know what the most important thing to give to them is your respect. And even more important, on those very top tier, send them patience. Like Paul said, if somebody comes in and they have uh, uh, itinerant paradigms is coming in their office or going they're thinking about it very hard for them to do if you're sending them patients it changes the whole paradigm so you've got to thank and recognize these people that support you next part of our action plan is our image as professionals most of us don't even think about image it's not professional you think uh, image is show business but you know what almost all business is show business and like it or not, you've got an image. 
makes sense that you might want to do what you can to make sure that image is congruent to what you want it to be. Because the bad news is if your patients don't accept your image, they're probably not going to accept your treatment. Most people decide whether or not they're going to accept treatment before a treatment plan is ever offered, and it's based to a great degree on your image. You have to establish your office as an expert in your community, in something. Periodontics is probably not enough. You've got to determine what do you want to be known for, and your patients have to know that. And once you make that determination, then your entire office has to revolve around that. It has to be your image, and everybody has to live that. Your patients have to know what you're known for. And it can't be good quality periodontics. That's not enough. Ask your patients when they come in, what do you think of our office? What are we known for? It's a good way to find out. And if that's not what you want it to be, then start working on that. You also have to think about what business you're in. Are you in the health business or the disease business? Most of us are in the disease business because that's how we were trained in dental school. I tell you what, all of those megatrends that are out there says that's the wrong business to be in because if you're in the disease business and you get rid of the disease, nobody wants you anymore. If you're in the health business, who doesn't want to be more healthy? Who doesn't want to be more beautiful? And that's what the baby boomers want. In reality, almost everything we're offering today revolves around discretionary dentistry. You need to make certain you know what business you're in. How about your own personal image? As the periodontist, you know, you lead. You need to be, you need to have the image of a successful periodontist. You need to be confident, but not arrogant. You need to be approachable. I mean, what's your, your personal appearance look like when you're, you're meeting the patient? Paul was saying, you know, he doesn't meet people in his scrubs. You know, What's your dental health like? You're, you're trying to, to sell these things, and if, if you don't look too good, that's a problem. There are studies that show that, especially women, when they meet a professional, they look at three things. A, a doctor, they look at three things. Shoes, watch, pen. Well, what if you're sitting there taking notes with a big pen that you chewed the top off? You know, it's maybe not providing the image that you want. Nonverbal communication is very important. And you also have to leave your personal problems at home. You've got to come in every day meeting the world with a smile. I don't care what you feel like. Today is the best day, and you're going to... Anybody ask you, how are you doing today, Doc? Wonderful. You've got to lead... You lead by example. There's no room for stinking thinking. And you've got to network. You can't do it by yourself. The intelligent do know everything, but the successful know everybody. I have built a network of people around me that have allowed us to achieve what we achieve. You've got to go out there and do that. Your office is an important part of your image as well. It doesn't have to be luxurious, but it does have to be updated and it has to be clean. Are your, are your bathrooms spotless every day? How, do you look? They have to be. Technology is also important because patients oftentimes translate technology to quality care. You know, they see high technology and they think, especially if you can tell them, show them how that adds value to their life, and less radiation, fewer appointments, those kind of things, it's important. But technology comes with a price tag, doesn't it? But Henry Ford said, if you need a product but don't buy it, you ultimately pay for it, but you don't have it. Success in periodontics is definitely built on relationships. Most of us are good at rapport. Rapport is just interpersonal warmth. But rapport is not enough. To be successful, you have to be in relationship with your customers, your dentists and your patients. Because think about it. If you're saying something to somebody, your customer, that is counter different to what somebody else that, that your customer is in relationship with, that could be an insurance company or their spouse, and you're saying something that's different than they're saying, who are they going to believe? They're going to believe that person that they're in relationship with. So you have to get to that same level to be successful. And our success is dependent on that. We go to meetings like this and we spend all of our time getting excited about the products, the techniques, and the procedures. But friends, that's not what's going to make us successful. The people make us successful. With the relationships with our patients, our team, and our referral sources. Communication skills are absolutely essential. Like it or not, if you, you go out and learn all these 
crazy, wonderful new techniques, but you may not get the opportunity to ever use them if you can't communicate them, if you can't sell them. The most important thing in, in practice is being able to create effective listening. And listening is, is listening to the spoken word, but also what's not being said as well. Really, you've got to do three things when it comes to listening. You've got to listen twice as much as you talk. You want to try not to... Peridonists are absolute masters of answering questions that were never asked. You know? Your staff would verify that. And then thirdly, you've got to listen so carefully that you can repeat back to them what they said in your words without judgment. Judgment destroys relationships. The most important written words in consultation is the benefit to you is. People do not buy connective tissue graphs. People buy the benefits of connective tissue graphs. If you have it, you should go back to your office, have a staff meeting, create lists of benefits for every procedure you perform so that you or your staff, the next time Susie comes up and says, well, I'm going to have a graph, you use bang, bang, bang. You're ready to say all the different benefits of those kind of things. But, of course, they have to be the benefits that are important to that particular individual. A need is something you want to get rid of. A want is something you want more of. What we've got to do is get people to want what it is they need, and the way you do that is focusing on the benefits. No and selling means I don't K-N-O-W enough about the benefits to say yes, and we've got to get our patients the opportunity to say yes to the best. Now, it's going to be shocking, but your excellent surgical techniques are not enough to make you successful. They are just like the ante in a poker game. They're just like your dental license. It's the bare minimum to allow you to enter the game. Your success is going to depend on everything else around that. And there's all sorts of good examples in industry. You know, Cisco is a, a nationwide food service company. They sell everything a restaurant would need. They sell food. They sell napkins. They sell uh, forks and spoons. They charge 10 to 15% more than their competitors. Year in and year out, they're number one leaders in sales in the United States. Now, how's that possible? How can you be in a price-sensitive, competitive environment, charge more than your, comp your, co your competitors, and, and are year in and year out leaders in sales? And their CEO said it pretty good to Forbes when he said, we don't sell food, we sell peace of mind. And what he meant by that was his customers, their customers are willing to pay more to know that the food's going to be of the quality they need to maintain their reputation. It's going to be there on time. Charles Revson said, in the store, I mean, in the factory, we make cosmetics. In the store, we sell hope. And for you and I to be successful, we've got to do that too. We've got to sell peace of mind, hope, and all the other benefits that we come up with because none of you are in competition with each other. I'm not in competition with the periodontist around the corner. I'm in competition with all of this. I'm in competition with discretionary time, I'm in competition with discretionary dollars. Cost is the excuse. By focusing on the benefits, we can overcome that. And we do it by piggybacking. We're great about, we want to tell everybody about how we're going to do this surgery, what sutures we're going to use. They don't care. Tell them about what the benefit is. Same thing with your dentist. Talk to them about the benefit of working with you. And don't make them figure it out. They're too busy. Spell it out. Talk to patients about benefits of periodontal therapy. Nobody thinks they're going to lose their teeth. That's too far out. You want here and now benefits. Here's just a few of them. Preserve bone, health, wellness, eliminate disease, fresh breath, enhance quality of life, peace of mind, make more beautiful, youthful, comfort, self-worth, confidence, sexy, save money and time in the future, and even resolve erectile deficiency. My God, life is good. Sign me up. <laughs> We've also got to understand that both our customers, our general dentists and our patients, not all of them really, they have, there's, there's barriers to working with us. And, and because of our training and because we're good people, we tend to think others are good too. And they're going to do the right thing. People don't always do the right thing. And you have to, to understand and deal with these barriers. Paul mentioned some of them. You know, Patients' most common barriers are time, pain, appearance, and money. 
general dentists' most common barriers are we're going to steal their patients, undermine their credibility, criticize their dentistry, and use up all the patient's money. It may or may not be true, but it is reality out there, and you've got to deal with it. You've got to resolve these objections, and you do it by asking. If it's a dentist, just like Paul said, you know, Frank, I hear that dentists have problems working with peridotes. Have you ever had a problem? You know, what kind of things have been issues? And then once you know that, say, you know what, I, I know how you feel. Others have felt the same. But you know what they found? Length the objection that they bring up to the feature in your office that's going to counter that objection and strongly tie it to the benefit of working with you. Or if it's a patient, Mrs. Jones, most people have something that bothers them about the treatment we talked about today. Tell me, what bothers you? I know how you feel. Others have felt the same. You've got to make certain that you disarm these issues before they happen. Don't think that because you're such a, you know, a wonderful guy, and even if you can get them jazzed up during the appointment, that they're going to go home and, and, and follow through with treatment if you have not resolved these issues, because they're going to come up and bite you at the wrong time. So you want to resolve them on your terms and not wait till the end. About 75% of the patients come to your practice ready to buy. If your case acceptance is lower than that, you're doing something wrong. Once a patient says, yes, I'm ready to make an appointment, then you need to follow through. You want to, again, link the symptom that you've discovered that's important to them to the feature in your office that's going to overcome their objection and strongly tie it with the benefit that you've found that's important to them. Reassure them with the three Fs that we just talked about. And then ask, how do you feel about what we've talked about today? And shut up. It's hard, isn't it? They'll fill the time if you just shut up. They'll tell you. And like Paul also, I don't give them a hundred different treatment options. Based on what I feel is the best for them, I will provide them with one treatment option. I think if you give them 14 different options, they leave far more confused than they came in. I give them one treatment option, and then I, I just make the simple statement, is this an appropriate time? Let them tell you. They may say, you know, Mike, what you said makes a lot of sense. But you know what? I've got three kids in college. Then that gives me the opportunity to, to turn the corner and say, okay, let's make quality the constant and time the variable, and let's figure out a way that's going to work with you. And when they are ready to go, you've got to reinforce that correct decision. If they're not ready to make an appointment, you need to call three or four or seven days later. See if there's any information that you can, any questions you can answer for them. Are they ready to make an appointment? It does a couple of things. It tells them that the, the therapy you're suggesting is important to them. And it tells them that you care. And if they do accept treatment, you should be sending out a letter that's time to go out about seven to 10 days after they've accepted treatment, telling them that you're very pleased to be part of their total health team, that the, the decisions they've made will provide benefits from years to come because there's something called post-purchase dissidence that after any major uh, purchase, about seven to 10 days, you start wondering, did I make the right decision? So you can come in and counter that. And most importantly, you've got to create value. That's always been important, but it's even more important and will become increasingly important with technology because technology is leveling the playing field. I can think of three issues or three examples. If anything you do can be digitized, I guarantee you I can find somebody better, cheaper, and quicker than you are. How about tissue engineering? What if I can take a tissue engineering device, slip it under the tissue before we suture, and it stimulates wound healing? It can change an average clinician to a master clinician. How about computer-guided uh, implants, uh, computer-guided surgical placement that allows a novice to place implants at 0.5 millimeter tolerances. It's limiting, it's flattening the playing field. You have to know what's value added that you're providing. You know, your patient reads the book by the cover and they don't really understand, they can't, they, they don't understand what quality is but they do understand what's going on in your office and you have to provide extraordinary service and value. What service? Service is being able to anticipate 
your customers' needs before they even happen. My partner, Todd, his family was at Disney World, Disneyland this weekend. Disney is great at this. They know that at 12 o'clock at night, when the park is closing, that there are X number of families carrying 3.2 kids out to the car only to find that they left their keys in the car. No problem. Disney has a locksmith on duty at 12 o'clock at night. You know, that service, providing all the little things, providing cappuccino or juice to your patients or, or uh, blankets. Uh, we, we gave out uh, umbrellas in our office to people who, uh, it's raining outside. Uh, oh, well, I'll bring it back. No, don't worry about it. You know, all of those things add up to, to an experience that they remember and tell their friends because it's all about perception. You know, to them, quality is, are the plants dead or alive? What's the reading material like? How long did it take to get the phone answered? When it was answered, what is it answered in a smile? Patients are not cost conscious. Anybody that has enough money to pay for the basic expenses do not turn down treatment based on cost. They turn down treatment based on value. Value is why a patient accepts your treatment. Value is why a patient will go past 20 periodontists come into your office. It's value, not cost. And it's okay to charge a premium. The best things in life do cost a lot of money. Don't be naive and think that your patients are going to translate excellent service for quality. Most won't. Excellent service is what they're paying for. Value is giving them what they don't pay for. And value, again, is a game changer because value is what they're going to remember long after they forgot what tooth you worked on. Success depends on our relationship with our team, like Paul said. You know, you need to make certain that your team understands that you respect them as individuals, that you respect them. Uh, they're not an overhead, they're an asset. You need to have pay, who, staff members that have been with you for, for you know, long periods of time because that, that speaks volumes to your patients when they come in. Your staff has to really understand the value of what you do because, as Paul said, if you're doing a procedure that costs more than what they're making in a week or maybe even a month and they don't understand the value, there is a big disconnect there. Can't let that happen. And you have to empower them. They have to know that they can make that situation right without coming to ask you. Even chambermaids at the Ritz-Carlton can immediately resolve an issue up to $3,000 without asking anybody. Think about that. If they could do it, what have you allowed your staff to do? Studies show that, that uh, patients see your staff eight times for every two times they see the doctor. These are important people. Your entire team has to understand everything that you do. You know, I took our staff to... Uh, a lecture that I was giving, and, and a couple came up to me and said, I didn't know we did that. That's inexcusable. Everybody from the front to the back has to know what you do. Everybody has to be able to provide the benefits of what you do and immediately be able to do that because your patients look to these people for second opinions. You know, you tell them something, but they're coming up the front desk, well, what do you think about that? He just said I ought to get this. So we said, well, you know, we've seen Dr. McGuire, Dr. McGuire do that many times. These patients do great. We know you are too. And you know, they need to be able to reinforce that. Your success also depends on team members outside your office. Like Paul said, if you're calling Dr. Jones and Susie answers, don't plow through Susie. Stop. Hi, Susie. This is Dr. McGuire. How are you today? Spend a little time. How's the family? Then you get to Dr. Jones because Susie is really important. And there's a lot of Susies out there that you need to spend time on. Obviously, our success depends on referrals from, from our relationship with the referral sources. You have to ask a basic question. Why would that guy or that girl send you a patient? And it's not because you're a good periodontist. That's not enough. You have to be able to show them what value you're going to provide to them, how you're going to make them li their life easier, how you're going to make them feel better about themselves, how you're going to make more money for them. If you can't answer those questions, it's unlikely they're going to send you patients very often. You know, I've always felt that my restorative doctors are my business partners, and I'm only going to be as successful as they are. 
The more successful I can make them, the more successful they're going to make me. And so there are certain things that we can offer them that will do just that. For example, we can reduce their overhead. You know, if we work together, we don't all have to buy expensive equipment. Tell you what, we'll supply the, the uh, CT scanner. You can do the, the CAD CAM machine. We'll buy the piezoelectric surgical instrument. You buy the digital impression. You know, you don't have to buy everything. In addition to that, it increases their efficiency. If you're placing implants uh, with precision, they have reduced overhead. If you're going in doing great soft tissue work, they have less recession, less remakes on their, res on their restorations. It goes without saying it reduces liability. It increases case acceptance because you have two offices working together. You're getting co-education. They're getting co-marketing. You have two professionals talking about the same kind of thing. And it tells the patient that this information we're imparting to you is important. That we're all agreeing that this is the best thing for you. And it allows us to re uh, result in superior outcomes. You know, somebody told me a long time ago, you could do anything you want, but you can't do everything you want. A lot of truth to that. And that working together, we can provide the best care. Also allows us to provide flexibility and increase our scope of practice without substantial capital improvements. For example, you know, we can work together to do all on four kind of approaches that neither of us could do by ourselves. Or, you know, we can provide uh, IV sedation and, and re sophisticated regenerative procedures that you're unlikely to be able to do on your own. And finally, it increases happiness and well-being. You know, nothing makes the day worse than if you're doing something you don't very, do very often and it starts to go south. You don't really know what to do next. You don't have all the instrumentation to do it. You know, it just makes sense that we need to spend our time doing things we enjoy doing and things that we're good at. And you know what? If you look at all of those things and you can talk to your referrals about here's how we can add value to your life, think about it. You and I are are able to provide three of the most sought after commodities in the entire world, health, wellness, and cosmetics, to a population that highly values those, that's got the money to pay for it. If life's not good, you're doing something wrong. Our success also depends on relationships with all of these other people. I've always had good referral relationships, for example, with orthodontists, sending patients, with hygienists, built my practice around hygienists, especially early. You know, hygiene study clubs, hygiene, you know, your hygienist with them, but most importantly, you with them, talking to them about, you know, how you can help them. Like Paul said, they just soak up the knowledge. Lab techs, this may, this may be one you hadn't thought of, and it's great. Again, that, that, ten, that group of ten great dentists I talked about, I guarantee you they're wanting to send to one or two labs because there's always in, going to be in your community one or two labs that the best dentists send to. If you can get that lab tech, to say something good about you to somebody you don't work with, wow. You know, maybe they're struggling with a case, and the guy says, you know, if you, Dr. Fugazzato, when I see his work, those implants are placed perfectly. Or, you know, have you seen the soft tissue work that he's done? You know, a well-placed word from a lab tech, fabulous. And, of course, medical community, public, you can just go on and on. You have to establish a relationship of trust and stand by them when they need them. That's with your GPs, with your uh, staff, and with your patients. We've all had issues where in the time of need, we've been let down. And like Paul says, it's bang. No second chance, you're gone. You've got to, to stand by them. And it's not enough to develop relationships. You've got to sustain them. And that's the hard part because I'm not going anywhere and I have to sustain this. It takes six times more marketing and promotion to gain one customer than it does to keep an existing one. Here's a marketing study that says, why do customers leave? 14% 14, 14 leave. And again, customers are GPs and dentists, I mean patients. 14% leave because of complaints not solved. 9% leave because of the competition. 9% leave because they or you have moved. 68% leave for no special reason. Do you believe that? Seven out of 10 leave for no special reason? Don't believe that. They left for a reason. They may have not told you, but they left for a reason. They left because they, you, you didn't make them feel appreciated. You didn't take care of their needs. You were too busy. They left for a reason. And we have to learn from those people. You know, when there's a problem, run to it. Don't run away from it. If you, if you resolve these issues early, you could actually build relationships. And, and being able to do this is the acid test of your practice's customer service system. You know, ask, how was your visit today? 
It's important. And, and if they say something great, what a perfect time to ask for a referral. If they say something not so great, you need to know it. And you need to, to act on it and make sure they know that you take this to heart and you're going to act on it. If they say, you know, it's the old saying, you know, happy people tell a few people and mad people tell even more. Well, in today's digital world, they can tell millions. And to me, this is the biggest reason you want to be involved with social media. Because if you have somebody that gets upset with you and they're social media savvy, instantly millions of people will know about it. If you don't have a presence out there, very difficult to deal with. If you already have a presence, there's a bunch of people out there who have said good things about you, then they'll think, oh, well, you can't please everybody or this person's a crackpot. But if you don't have a social presence and you have somebody out there, it's difficult to counter. You need to address the problem quickly and completely. You need to be aware of what's being said out there. There's all these different sites on reviews. Don't react defensively and respond with excellent public relations. So to conclude, how are we going to do this? First, you've got to develop your vision. Know where you want to go or you'll never get there. Second, take charge of your career. Understand that only you can do this. Nobody can do it for you. Market the qualities that make you unique. Refine your image. Develop and sustain relationships with your team, referral sources, and patients. Concentrate your resources. Know what business you're in. Focus on the benefits, not the service. Create a safe environment for your dentists, for your staff, for your patients. Provide extraordinary service and value. Incorporate change in your practice. And do it every day. You know, it's unlikely that somebody's going to come down on high and tap me on the shoulder and say, you know, Mike, the future of periodontal practice may look a little different than the way you used to practice 30 years ago. And I've hoped that in some way I've begun to get you to think about that a little bit because we stand at a critical juncture here today. The first step in understanding that you're going to take your practice to a new level is understanding there is a next level. You can stand in the shadows and let the world pass you by, or you can create a future of choice and catapult into where you really want to be. Times of great change like we're in right now are also times of great opportunity. In stable times, everything's got a name and everything's got a place and you can leverage very little. But in times of extraordinary change, you can create all sorts of leverage, personally and professionally. If you know where you're going, if you've got the tools to get there, and we all have those. I'd like to, to close my little story about change here with one of the point, most point, poignant stories about change that I ever read. It comes from a book called uh, Managing at the Speed of Change by Daryl R. Connor. And, and he talks about an interview that he did from a, a rig superintendent on this oil platform in the North Sea in July of 1988. The worst oil catastrophe in the history of oil exploration happened that night. 166 crew members and three rescuers lost their life that night on this oil rig. When he was interviewed from his hospital bed, Andy said he was just, there was a tremendous explosion and it just blew him out of his bunk bed. The alarms were blaring, sirens were going off, the smoke was so thick. He had to feel his way to the edge of the platform where he jumped 150 feet in water so cold he knew if he wasn't picked up within 20 minutes he would die. To make matters worse, you can see the surface of the oil of the water had ignited from floating debris and oil. Yet Andy jumped 15 stories into that freezing, burning water. When he was asked why he made that potentially fatal leap, he didn't hesitate. He said, it's either jump or fry. He took that leap because 
It was his only option. He didn't jump because he knew he'd be rescued. He didn't jump because it would be intellectually intriguing. He didn't jump because it would be a personal growth experience. He jumped because he had no other option. The price of staying on that platform, the price of status quo was just too high. I think there's a lot we've got to learn from Andy. I think there's never been a better time to be a periodontist or be a patient in need of periodontal services. But we can't do that by hanging on to the past. Future periodontal practices will look different than they did in the past. The riskiest strategy of all in times of great change is maintaining status quo. We've got to incorporate change. We've got to do it on our terms and not theirs, and we have to do it before it's too late. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to be here this afternoon.